Hello, I'm Chaplain R.T. Byram for Through the Gathering Storm. Does God really need me or you to praise Him? In other words, is God a narcissist? And that word is defined as someone with an exceptional interest in or admiration for oneself and implies egotism, vanity, and yes, even conceit. After all, the Bible does contain many scriptures telling believers to worship and praise God. As far back as in the beginning, God declares this to the Israelites as seen in Exodus 20, verse 23. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. In verse 5, then God declared his anger at those who ignored his warning. Exodus 20, verse 5 says, You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And further, all mankind will eventually realize that there is one true God. In Romans 14, 11, it says, It is written, As surely as I live, said the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. Taken in human terms, doesn't it sound as though God needs to have all of His creation bowing and praising and worshiping Him? The answer is, of truth, no. Of course it isn't. We must understand that the act of worshiping God is for our sake, so that we may know beyond the shadow of a doubt that we need Him for our very existence. By focusing on the One who made us, we shield ourselves from other voices that would have us follow their false gods of this world. Praise and worship toward God is also our way of acknowledging Him and expressing our profound thankfulness for everything that He has given us from the very beginning. The creation of the first man began when God formed Adam and then breathed life into him. Here's that account way back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. See, no other creature was made to look like God. Then we go to Genesis 1, verse 27, and it says, And so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Did you realize that all creatures except man were created already alive? You see, only man received the very breath of the Creator. Why, you say? Because the breath placed us above all other creation. We were endowed at that time with the spirit of man. And that provides our intellect, our emotions, our ability to love and to become co-inheritors with Christ after the resurrection. There's still more that God does that deserves our praise. You see, He sustains us after our creation. He sustains us all our life. If we go to Psalm 3 and we look at verse 5, this is what it says. I lay down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. So you ask, how does He sustain us? Well, one of the most automatic things that we do is breathe in and breathe out. So let's look at that one function and marvel at its profound meaning. We were created with lungs that need to take in oxygen to feed and cleanse every cell in our body. And we breathe out carbon dioxide. You see, plants need carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight for photosynthesis to occur. Oxygen is a byproduct of that process. And the cycle of symbiosis or mutual dependence on each other for life continues. You see, we need the plants, and they need us. Now, just stop and think about that for a moment. Only a Creator God could have provided both at the same time. The theory of evolution does not provide for simultaneous appearance of interdependent entities, and God created the entire universe in complete balance. Our Earth, for instance, is at a precise distance from the sun to give us light and warmth and healing rays. 
It also feeds the plant life that is our food as well as our materials used for shelter and clothing. He gives us rain in due season and a never-ending cycle of water. He provides the air we breathe and He regulates our bodies through His divine design. Even our sleep cycles are established for Him to refresh and rebuild us, all part of the sustaining process. Now here's yet another reason why we should praise and worship Him. He protects us. Psalm 32, 7 says this, You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. So how and when does God give us such protection? I have yet to meet a believer in God who hasn't had at least one occasion to say, there but for the grace of God. They recall near misses from a serious accident or violent weather or the unexpected receipt of food, clothing, or shelter when everything seems hopeless. Even more, God promises those who accept His gift of salvation that they may find deliverance during the coming apocalyptic events. Listen to this incredible assurance of safety that you'll find in Psalm 91. This is verse 1 and 2, and it says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. That passage shows some of the fearful events that are in the described time of the end or times of the end. Now, why would anybody refuse supernatural protection in those rapidly approaching days? But even now, you see, God provides for our daily needs. In Acts 14 and 17, it says this, He has not left Himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. If you offer thanks before a meal, and you should, does the fact that everything we eat to keep us alive come from God's bounty? See, science has never created a food out of thin air. All their efforts begin with elements that God has already placed in their hands. Even a magician can only produce a rabbit from his hat because it existed as part of God's creation. In spite of his power, and his might, he bends down to this tiny speck of matter and shows his love for us as his children. Listen to this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. King David wrote of the boundless depth of his love in Psalm 118 when he said in verse 1, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. And proof of His love is the greatest of promises, that of eternal life. If we believe in and accept the saving sacrifice of His Son Jesus, then we can take these words from John 3.16 to heart. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. The Apostle John adds this in John 5, verse 24. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes Him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And now consider the chilling price of not believing. John 3.36 says this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son of God will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. 
Let me put all of this in very human terms. When we find the one who is or will become our mate, we express gratitude to them for loving us. When such love is unselfish and genuine, husbands and wife complement each other by providing for each other's physical and emotional needs. History is also filled with heroic stories of people who gave up their life just to save their mate. Now multiply that billions of times over when the Son of God became flesh to dwell among those, the very creatures that He had created. And He lived a sinless life and died an excruciating death on the cross to pay for the sins of all of us. If we would cherish the memory of a mate who died for us, how much more should we deem the sacrifice of Jesus the Christ? Listen, we are commanded to worship God so that we never forget that we were purchased by the blood of Jesus. We belong to Him. An attitude of gratitude keeps us focused so that when God the Father calls us to inherit eternal life, we will be drawn to Christ, receive the Holy Spirit, gain wisdom and understanding, and look forward to a resurrection into a life without pain, without tears, and without end. Jesus, who is the Son of God, and who became the Son of Man to offer Himself for our redemption, prayed constantly to God the Father. And his prayers ask for the blessing and protection on those who believed and who would believe even today. Throughout the scriptures, we read of him giving honor to the Father for all things. You've seen the bracelets that contain the letters WWJD, what would Jesus do? And that should be a reminder for us to pray likewise for everything that we are, everything that we have, and everything that we will receive, including a new body at the resurrection that will never again see death. At the beginning, I ask the question, does God need me and need you to praise Him? The true answer is this. It is we who need Him, and we need to give Him praise so that we may never forget that He has accepted us as the reborn children in the family of God. Take heart in what you have just learned. Watch this several times with your Bible open and ask God to show you His truth. Until next time, this is Chaplain R.T. Byram asking God's blessing on you and yours.